In an industry where less than 5% of the positions are held by women, you may expect to hear experiences of backlash, undermining, and overreaching. However, today we will hear from a woman professional who will share with us firsthand how with the right support and resources, women can thrive and excel in a male-dominated industry. Welcome to the Women's Leadership Today podcast, a feature of Women's Leadership Today. I'm your host, Michelle Myers. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Liz Blanco, a pilot with United Airlines. I was fascinated to learn that in the U.S., less than 5% of pilots are women, and I asked Liz to join us and share her experiences in this industry. Liz, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Hi, thank you for having me as well. Well, Liz, to get us started, can you tell us a bit more about your path to becoming a pilot with United. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I knew my senior year of high school that I wanted to be a pilot. Um, I ended up watching, my dad told me about WASP pilots. And of course I grew up learning about Amelia Earhart, but um, that really got me interested in um, you know, this genre of that nobody really talks about in school really, except for that little excerpt of well, there's Amelia Earhart, she crossed the Atlantic by her solo, and then that's about it. But when my dad told me about um, women aviation supply pilots of World War II, I was completely intrigued my senior year. So I decided, hey, I want to be a pilot. So I um, grew up in LA and I searched up um, aviation schools and I found a university here in Denver, Colorado, that has a four-year program um, in aviation technology. And what you do is you go through a four-year college um, bachelor's, but you're also working in tandem getting your pilot license. So it starts with getting your private in, um, license, your instrument rating, then your commercial, then your multi-engine. Um, so I did that. Most people will typically become a CFI, which is a certified flight instructor, and build their time that way. But um, my dad was in the military growing up. And um, he always taught me that, hey, you know, like naval aviation. And of course, in our generation, we grew up with the whole Top Gun um, <laughs> generation of like, that's, you know, go, go, go Navy, right? Fly Navy. So my dad really pushed that. And um, I decided to go the Navy route as a pilot. So I went to, after college, I went to OCS, which is officer candidate school, and then to flight school. There, um, I flew for a couple of years, but I met my now husband, who was a navigator and an FO. So um, decided that, hey, since he's a navigator, why don't you stay in the military and then I'll go fly privately or commercially? So I um, got out of the Navy and so that we could be based together because we were like basically like opposite coasts. We were doing long distance for years, all through flight training. Oh, wow. So I decided to get out as the aviator and go fly for the regionals. So I was at the regionals for about a year. This is back in about like 2005, um, where region, when regional pilots didn't make much money. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was kind of like, you know, you're young, you're single, or you're, you know, without kids and you're, you know, you, you have a bachelor pad or you have roommates, which is what we all did as young pilots. So I did that route and um, did that for a year. And then we um, had our son. And um, after having our son, my husband got orders to Washington, D.C. And then that right there put a big hole, actually, in my aviation career because, I'm, you know, we're, we're with the baby and we go to Washington, D.C. And I'm like, all right, well, where can I fly here in D.C.? And the nearest base for Continental Connection, which is the, the company I had been working with, was in Newark. Um, so we decided that, hey, let's concentrate on his career for a while. I'll stay at home with the baby. And since I'm doing that, well, why don't we have all our kids um, as soon as possible back to back <laughs> and um, I'll stay home for a couple of years. So um, a couple of years turned into 12 years. Oh, wow. Um, but it always remained, um, you know, a it was a sticking point with me when people, you know, you go at the park and you're doing play dates with the kids and the other moms and everybody's like, oh, you know, what do you do? And, and it's like, I'm a stay at home mom, you know, 
there was always like, ah, oh, like, but I'm really a pilot. And people, <laughs> yeah. you know, people's reaction was just always like, so like, all right. Inspiring. Like, oh my God, you're a pilot. Like really? Like, who do you fly for? And I'm like, well, I'm not flying for anyone right now. And it was always like in the back of my mind of like, but it, I will one day, like, it's just, mm-hmm. like, you know, next year or, or when the kids are a little bit older and, you know, and life happens, um, the kids and, and when they're little and I have, I have three boys um, and they're all back to back in age. And uh, it just, it was so difficult for me to find a job that would keep me home as an aviator. So um, like I said, that turned into a 12 year well, let's just wait till they're a little bit older. And then finally, um, in 2018, um, when they were in like middle school and I, and I realized that I'm like, you know what, this is a perfect time. They're pretty self-sufficient. Um, you know, they're stable at school. My husband's job is stable. I'm going to start looking around. And uh, we were living in San Diego at the time. So I um, started flying at the local um, airport and I was flying skydivers, of course, making like no money, <laughs> right? You're, you're like, you're like, making, like, seriously, like just uh, like a few bucks. But it was one of those things I was like, like, I'm just going to rebuild my time and do this for, for a few months and then see where it goes. And that's kind of, and that's where you have to kind of start from scratch all over again. Right. And it's, when, but when you're an aviator, like there's like pilots and then there's aviators. I feel like when aviators like love what they do, like we will do it for free. Like you're like, okay, flying skydivers, $14 a jump. I'll do it. Like, you know, it's, it's just so much fun. We love what we do. So I did that for about um, just, just under a year. And then flying there at the local um, airport by my house, I was hired um, for a military contract company at a Navy North Island. Um, flying um, dash sixes, which are twin otters, to the outer islands from military base as a contractor, and uh, that was like super cool because I not only was I hired at, um, and became upgraded a captain like immediately, but I also became our site lead. So I was running the operation there. Oh wow! And it was something that uh, it, you know, it's it's one of those things that like before I it, it was twelve years without flying. I started from the very bottom flying skydivers with like other 20 year old like pilots, right. Who are like time building, but it just, once you're in it, it's like everything in life. Like once you, you're already have the wheels turning, everything happened so fast. It was like, I immediately got hired for this other company. I immediately upgraded. Then I became our manager and then COVID hit. And because we were a military contract, and we're flying for the military, none of our operations stopped. So we were actually still flying a ton and I was building a, a ton of time. So um, a little bit past COVID, right when the airline started um, to hire again, I was hired with Alaska Airlines and, and um, flew the 737 there, which was really cool. I really enjoyed flying with Alaska. But um, having gone to school in Denver, uh, you, where United Airlines has a base, it was always like the epitome of that, that this is where you want to go. This is the company to work for. And I always felt that way, especially with the worldwide operations on the growth that United has had and continues to have and will be having in the future. I always knew that like, hey, this is where I want to be. So um, about, let's see, about a year ago when I was at Alaska, I just always stayed, um, you know, concentrated on applying here at United and working on updating my resume and making connections. And and luckily I had, you know, I still had contact with some some military pilots that are friends that are all here at United. And I was like, hey, like, this is the company I want to work for. Ultimately, how can I do this? And, you know, and and they did. They, They helped me. They're like, hey, this is, you know for your interview, this is what you want to do, you know, study this. Um, I had a lot of support from a couple of uh, Navy buddies. So that was really, really nice. And um, obviously got hired. I started flying the 737 here at United and now I'm on the 787 Dreamliner, which does the long haul international ops. And um, as we've discussed um, privately, you know, I just picked up flight instructor here in Denver where I currently live. Yeah which starts in December and I'm super excited. Um, 
And the way it's, you know, it's been a, a long journey for me over 20 years um, to get here to United. Uh, but it's definitely, you know, and it's it's had its its ro- its bumps and it's had its screeching halts and then it's had these huge like d- like dead space, right? But I feel like when there's something that you want like deep down and it's it, it becomes like who you are, right? It becomes your part of your identity, it becomes part of part of your DNA. Um, there's just nothing to stop you, like nothing in life, right? I felt like could stop me not having children not having a husband in the military, which had its challenges because it was always the needs of the, of the Navy um, when he was in the Navy because he's now retired. But, and, or the kids, you know, where we'd move. I, I always knew in the back of my mind that like, okay, this is going to, this is something that is going to happen. I don't know when, but it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And, what, and it's just, if you stay focused, which is what I did, right? And I, and I stayed positive. Because it's something that I love to do. I've always loved it. I loved it since day one. Um, that, like I said, it just became part of my DNA, and and here I am. No, I love that that message, that takeaway. If there's something that you're really passionate about, you will find a way to make it happen. Absolutely. And that road might not look like what you first expected, right? But you'll go through those ups and downs and those turns, <laughs> but you'll eventually get there. And there was something else you said, Liz, that I thought was so interesting. Uh, you were talking about, you know, you had all this experience, but you wanted to take, you know, that, that pause, uh, to, to focus on, on family. Um, but then you went and sort of started what you call sort of, you know, at, I guess the bottom rung of the ladder sort of, um, do you find that that's typical in your industry? If a pilot or aviator wants to take an extended time off, Oh, uh, is that typical that they need to kind of step back down and sort of start over? Or was that just sort of the unique position and opportunity open to you? Um, it, it, you know, it's also part of the times, right? Like right now, there's a, a huge need for pilots. So um, I think right now the path is a lot faster where it's like, okay, uh, you've had this big break maybe in in flying and in, in in your job, but Hey, well, the companies are more willing to help you get your currency back up. Um, so it's all about currency and, and the FAA, um, the federal aviation administration sets these mandates, right? That like, Hey, you have to have so many landings and takeoffs and, you know, night landings and instrument approaches. And there's all these regulations that you have to meet in order to be current. Okay. So, um, you know, I think it just depends specifically on a person's um, time. Um, You know, do you come out of the military with all this PIC time or are you coming out of the regionals um, just with second in command time and now you need to build PIC time? So it's going to depend on like just each individual's uh, time. Makes sense. And Liz, when, you know, I first read the statistics, when looking into, you know, the airline industries, I was really surprised by how few women pilots there are in commercial airlines. You know, I I expected it to be low. I knew it would be low, but I didn't realize how low. And I was wondering if you saw the same type of numbers when you were flying from the military. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, like even I went to an aviation college, right? Um, there in every class, I was always like one of one in a class of like 30 or one of two oh, wow. okay. women in the class of, of about 30 students. Uh, military, same thing. Um, in my, uh, you know, flight school, there were always like two of us, maybe three, um, you know, in, in a class behind me. And then in the following class, one. And then in class of like, we're talking about a class of like 50 students. Oh, wow. So yeah, the, the numbers were really, really low, um, <laughs> particularly in the military. And I mean, I'm, I'm also in my 40s. So this was, you know, tw- 20 years ago, which I think like in in everything, um, not only in aviation, but in all other careers, you know, those numbers are going up. Um, not as fast, I think, in aviation as I think most of us would like to see. But I think, you know, that goes to what 
the root cause of why the exposure of why young women aren't really going into these fields. And I felt like it was something that I experienced. I just didn't know about it. Right. Like I just so happened to have my dad, my senior year, tell me stories of lost pilots. And then um, I remember going to our high school library and pulling up fish files, like old (laughs) newspapers and looking at these awesome pictures of these World War II um, women, women Air Force supply pilots. And I was like, these women are so cool. Like they're gorgeous. They're smart. They were super brave. They were pioneers. Like what, why aren't we told about this in school? Why exactly. isn't anybody talking about this? And this is like when we had like, you know, PBS, that was, that was like the only exposure I had to any documentaries right now. We have Netflix and Amazon and all these other yeah, streaming places that we could look up things. But back then it was just PBS. So if you missed a special, then you missed it. Right. And there was it, like I said, a push or, or an availability of information that like, you know what, like women are doing this and, um, it's it's they've been doing it for a really long time. It it just I think it just needs to be kind of like that. Those doors need to be opened up. That book needs to be not just Charles Lindbergh and what he did, and then not just like a small paragraph on Amelia Earhart crossing the Atlantic. How about like all these other women, not only in aviation and other fields that are pioneers, like and and it's and it's coming. Like I said, I mean, I just watched um, you know a documentary on like women engineers in the 1950s, you know? And, you know, of course we have like the movie Hidden Figures and whatnot that you're like, what? I didn't even know this happened, you know? (laughs) So it's happening. But I think this, like what we're doing, right? Like what we're just, just open, having exposure and different um, from podcasts to maybe newspapers to magazines, especially magazines, right? Like. Mm -hmm. I grew up reading like Elle and Vogue and I know they're fashion magazines, but there's always like, you know, why not have a section on like, Hey, what are women doing out there? You know, oh, absolutely. With, yeah. that are fashionable. Maybe, <laughs> right? You tie it in. So it sounds like one of the main barriers in, in your eyes to uh, women entering this field is like, you're saying like the exposure or, awareness of of the opportunities of this career path yeah absolutely and what have been your experiences in working in this industry as one out of like you said 30 or even uh 50 women um well i mean i think it's it's varied a little bit because i did have um a little bit of the military even though i didn't stay in the military very long i i got out early um it's like, in, like for example, I'll start it like from the very beginning. When I went as a 19 year old to the local airport to learn to fly, um, it, it was super like accepted in the general aviation industry, right? To have young women come to learn to fly. Okay. I didn't feel any kickback. I didn't feel any discrimination. I didn't feel any like negative attitudes. Oh, good. Um, and th- at the school too, in college, it was kind of like I felt like more like. Well, because you're young and like, like my peers, other fellow 20 year olds were more in- curious of like, oh, who's the girl in the class? Right. So it, I, you know, and I made really good friends in classes. Um, so really, and the professors were really, really awesome at Metropolitan State University. I had a really good experience there. Um, and then in the military, uh, pretty much same thing. Um, you know, you, you did have a couple of like of the good old boy, older generation, mm-hmm. maybe lieutenant commanders, commanders who were a little more like, oh, there's a girl, you know, and it's like, no, there's a woman, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. there's not a girl in the squadron, there's a woman, right? Uh, but, and, uh, you know, a little bit of that being spoken over um, from people from from men from that generation. You know, you experience it here or there, but it's not everyone. So you you learn that, like, okay, you know what, that guy's just he's not really up with the times. And then you kind of learn to just be like, that's his problem, not mine, because you you would have I would have other um, instructors or fellow pilots 
who were like super cool on the contrary, or very, um, not only like fun and cool, but they were also very encouraging. Right. And I had a ton of instructors in the military that were like, Oh, Elizabeth, like you got this. You're, you're so smart. Like, and I'd be like, you know, cause you always, you're your own worst critic. So sure. you fly an approach and you're like, Oh, I or a landing. You're like, Oh, I could have done that better. And they're like, that was awesome. You know, and you know, they elevate you a lot and they do that to everyone, you know, the, the good instructors or the good pilots that you fly with. Um, and then going out in the, like now in commercial aviation, it's like nine, I've had like 99.9% .9 of extremely amazing um, pilots that I fly with, um, particularly at United, um, where it's a very um, supportive environment. And that is just, it makes a world of a difference. Yeah, that's, that's really amazing and wonderful to hear. It sounded... It sounds like you had more, much more support and encouragement than we'd probably actually expect given, again, the differences between the number of women in the field and, and the number of, of men. So it sounds like overall, for the most part, it was a very positive experience for you. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and you have that one person, right? Every, I think every job or every office has like that one person that's like, yeah. you know, you're not too crazy about you know, luckily, um, in, in my industry where if, and, and I, I fly with other FOs that say the same thing. They're like, oh yeah, you know, that captain's, eh, you know, not my favorite. It, it, I don't feel like it's a male, female difference. It's just that person's just not like the funnest or the easiest to get along with. Right. Cause you're flying in a flight deck in a very confined space for hours and that's just natural. I think it's human nature, but I look at things like I'm so much of a, you know, half a cup, half full, you know, not half empty. Like I'm, I'm so like, always like, Hey, maybe he's having a bad day or, Hey, you know what? Um, I'm constantly thinking, I'm like, maybe his home life is just, isn't, isn't like as good as it could be. That's why he's, he's like, just, grumpy or he's not like the most outgoing person. That's not my problem. Um, and I, you know, it's, it's just human nature. Like I said, I, I think, you know, you could talk to other female aviators that maybe have had some bad experiences and I'm sure they're out there. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, just because I haven't doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, but that's in any industry. I mean, I think you could ask anyone, <laughs> And, you know, who's a nurse be like, you know, I think it'd probably be harder to work with all women <laughs> than, <laughs> you know, I'm just, or maybe it's because that's all I know that I've always worked with mostly men, but I would never, ever say that I've had anyone deter me from, um, you know, professionally at all. That's, that's wonderful. That's absolutely wonderful to hear. And does, uh, mentorship play a role and your industry, like you said, you, you mentioned a number of times how you had some great support and encouragement. And I'm just curious if there's any sort of formal um, mentorship that that goes on or if it's more sort of informal on a individual basis. Yeah, there's there's definitely a lot of support out there. Um, I'm a member of the women um a aviation international group i'm a member of the female latino uh so it's it's latino pilots association as well um there's these groups right that you could definitely reach out of and be a part of um but i feel like it's more the mentorship has just comes from like people that come in and out of your lives in different phases right like mm -hmm. i when i went back into aviation in 2018 the flight instructor I had um, at the local airport, he was a prior naval um, rotary helo pilot. So, and he was like older and he had that dry, crusty humor and that works well for me. And he took me under his wing and because I was like, oh, look, Karen, I haven't flown in like 12 years. I feel like this is, it's scary, you know? And he's like, Liz, you got this, you know? He's like, come on, girl. <laughs> like he just... You find people throughout your career that just really become your mentors. Mm -hmm. 
But um, like I said, more of the mentorship is just people that I've kind of just run into um, throughout my, my aviation career that you, you just gel with, right? That you need. And everybody needs like somebody different. Like for me, it works really well when I have that really strong male. Um, so like I said, almost like saltiness, like let's go. Like doesn't even give me time to like, you know, like that. Um, don't even think about it, Elizabeth. Let's just get in the airplane. And let's go. And you'll see, you know, you'll do great. And then you do. And then you land and you're like, oh, yeah, that wasn't that bad. <laughs> you know, like, oh, well, yeah, I can do this. So that works well for me. But maybe somebody else, you know, that's, they need diff different types of mentorship. But it's out there, you know, and I and I think it's you just have to put yourself open and ask, ask, you know, like, I feel like. I feel like a kid at all times in every phase of my career. I always feel like the junior kid because I'm always like, Hey, like, who do I talk to? Hey, who do I need to meet? Hey, like asking questions. Don't be a wallflower, you know? And I don't think many aviators are wallflowers anyways. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> most of us are type a, most of us are go getters. Most of us, you know, learn to advocate for ourselves. I mean, we're on the radios like all the time. You're out up there in the in the sky making decisions um, constantly. So you do tend to be more of a stronger personality. Um, and even if you're not, you learn to be right. You you just grow. And with age too, like I'm not the same pilot I was in my 20s and I am now in my 40s, right? Um, so, and that just comes with maturity and life experience. And I think this is so important in any of our careers, being open and, and asking questions, asking for that input and look for those answers. Definitely, definitely important for us all to do. And you kind of talked about your schedule, um, before Liz, you know, how right now it can kind of be all over the place. What do you find is the key to successfully integrating your your career and and your home life at this phase? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what works for me is that the days that I'm off, the time that I'm home, I'm home. Like I am, I go through days that, like well, last week I was home and I'm like, I haven't left the house in three days because I I'm really present, right? I I wake up, um, get the kids ready to school for school, I make them lunches. I make sure I say goodbye to them in the morning. I, I, you know, make sure I'm picking them up from school or, you know, the days that I'm home, I'm making dinner. I, I'm just really, really here. Um, and while they're in school, right, while, while they're not here, that's when I'm like, I go get my nails done. That's when I go get my hair cut. That's when I go maybe shopping during the day. Um, but once my kids are home, it's, I want them to feel and know that, Hey, mom is home. Mm -hmm. Like she is physically here. Just like when I was, when I was a stay at home mom, where I was just there all the time, con always available. And that's when I remind them that in the morning, I'm, cause they all have cell phones. Right. So I'm like, Hey, do you need anything? I'm home. And I try, cause they don't know my schedule. Right. And they're boys. So they're just like, yeah. Hey mom, hi mom, bye mom. You know, they're, they're not like, they're not <laughs> asking questions like, mom, are you going to be home tomorrow? You know, they're not, they're just like, whatever yes. mom is, is dinner ready mom. Right. So I just make sure that <laughs> I'm physically, emotionally and mentally here for them when I'm home. And then when I'm gone, you know, I am, they, they know. And I tell them like, Hey, you, you need anything. You, you call your dad, you know, and you need anything. Uh, text me because, we'll, you know, we'll have Wi-Fi in the plane, but I can't talk, but you can text me, but only if it's important. Don't text me, you know, because you're squabbling with your brother. Like, I just don't even answer. And I tell them, I'm like, uh -uh, mom, mom's working, mom's working. Like, and, and I draw that line. Yeah. So it's something that I make very clear to my husband. I'm like, when I'm gone, don't, I don't want to hear fights. I don't want to hear that, you know, who has practice, who has games, because they all play football, whatnot, he takes care of it when I'm gone. But then when I'm home, like I said, I'm really, really present. So it does feel, it's it's a lot, right? Um, so I try to balance it with like my overnights when I'm working to really do a lot of me time. Like, uh, I mean, we met in London, right? Like mm -hmm. when, we did. And when, we I did. Go, when I'm in London, I'm like, hey, I'm going to out. And I'm walking around the city and I'll go to a pub and I'll really see 
like London and really do it me time. I won't stay in the hotel and micromanage my home life. Mm -mm. Well, it, it sounds like you really practice so many of the things that we talk about on our program. One is setting boundaries, right? Um, but also being present and in the moment. So your kids, you know, when you're home, they know that you're there for them. But then we've also talked about the importance of self-care too. So it sounds like, you know, those three, those are kind of the three cornerstones uh, to finding that integration or that, that balance that is so important to keep us going and doing our best both when we're home and, and on the job. So I think that's wonderful that you've really been able to, um, to find those three, like I said, those, those three cornerstones. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, I mean, it's taken years, right? Like, sure. Oh yes. I understand. It's not something we do overnight. Yeah. It's a lot of it is experience and <laughs> life and mm -hmm. figuring out what works and very quickly what doesn't. Right. Absolutely. Well, and Liz, well, I'd like to thank you so much for being on with us today. It's been so much fun and I just loved hearing your story and really wanted to uh, share Ed and your your journey with, with our audience. Um, and as we start to wrap up today, you know, what advice would you give to any, uh, you know, young women out there that are that are interested in this field? Yeah, I mean, for the younger generation, it's it's more like, I don't mean, I don't have to tell you that the world is your oyster, right? Like, if you're already looking into aviation and being a pilot, you'll most likely have that attitude and outlook on life of like, like bring it, like let's put in the work, right? Okay. So put the work in if you love it and it is work, it's studying, right? But I, I think, you know, if you're, if you're in this field, you're going to, you're going to see that like, yeah, okay. It's a lot of work, but you have so much reward. And as we're all like, constantly in the air and you're like, wow, this is what I get to do, right? This is beautiful. Um, we all love what we do. And I think like, I'd like to give some advice there to like older women actually, because I actually meet a lot of women who are in their, you know, forties and fifties who are like, oh, you know, I got my private pilot license when I was 20 and they never did anything with it because they got married and had kids or life happen, right? And I'm like, it's never too late, like at all. And I mean, you'd be would be surprised of how many like flight attendants I meet who are like, I've always wanted to be a pilot. I'm working on my privates or I'm working on my commercial now. And oh, wow. they're not like 25, you know, they're like later mm -hmm. in life. Just, they've had a whole career as a flight attendant who are like, I'm finally doing it. I'm like, that's amazing. Because I think that really takes a lot of bravery, right? Absolutely. Just, I think there's the advice is like, you be, you do you, right? There's no comparison to anybody else. Every, every pilot's like such an individual and there's no one to measure yourself like against. Like you're just, you could go at your own pace or you go as fast as you want. And Anybody can do it if they love it. You just have to love it, right? Like, and like I said, and that's the beauty of pilots. Like, we love what we do. So that's the advice that I'd give is just do it. Just, it. just oh. do what you love. There's no, don't think about it. Like, <laughs> come up with a plan. Like, what money do I need? What tools? Like, everything and anything in life is going to take effort. And I think that's where I feel like I, where I meet people are like, oh, but it's, it feels like it's such a like far, like, oh, how would I do this? Like you just like, when I got started again in 2018, just go to the airport. I, I didn't even like call. I just showed up and to the local like flight school. <laughs> I was like, hi, I haven't flown in 12 years and I need to buy a sticker, you know? And it's just, that's how you do it. You just knock on doors. Well, Liz, well, thank you so much for joining us today. I, I had so much fun talking with you and um, I love your positive outlook. And again, just that message of, you know, if there's something you want to do, just do it. Just go. You'll find your way. You'll find your way. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure. And I love sharing, you know, my passion with other people. So thank you so much, Michelle.
Oh, yeah. I thank you so much. And well, I'd like to also thank, uh, say thank you to all of our listeners for joining us today. We release two episodes a month available to watch on YouTube. And you can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite streaming service. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. All right. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Liz. Thank you for listening. The Women's Leadership Today podcast is just one feature of the Women's Leadership Today community. We empower women to advance in their career through targeted professional development learning experiences and resources, such as live and on-demand courses, customized training solutions, up-to-date publications, and more. Visit womensleadershiptoday.com to join our community and take your career to the next level. Together, we can empower women everywhere to lead, innovate, and inspire change.